My name is Jillian, and I grew up in Massachusetts. I am from a family of four kids, and I'm the youngest by quite a bit. And um, my dad was a radiologist, and I'd say the town that we grew up in is a small town in Massachusetts, and there was a lot of pressure to um, perform and achieve and succeed. So that's kind of like the background um, to my brother and how he was raised. Um, and so the one thing I wanted to talk about in terms of like when I was an adult, I um, was pregnant with hoping to, for my second child, and I was in the second trimester, and I found out that he uh, was lacking parts of his brain, and he wasn't going to live. And so I, the ultrasound tech said it. I could tell from her face that she looked worried, and so she went and got the doctor, and then they came back and said that, and so. It's 100% fatal. It was something obviously I never planned on. I was taking prenatals and um, not drinking coffee, not like drinking doing alcohol. Yeah, doing everything. Yeah. yeah. And then it was just there was something I couldn't control. And I wanted the doctors to fix it. And of course, they couldn't fix it. So I had the baby in me for about a week, knowing that I was going to terminate the pregnancy. And that was really awful because, I mean, it was so weird because on one level, I felt like a bad mom, even though I was making the right decision for, you know, the most humane decision for him and for myself. But I went ahead and terminated the pregnancy. And um, my brothers, both my brothers called me afterwards to, you know, to console me and say that it was going to be okay and I would have another baby. But something that I know that people who have experienced that type of loss understand is that it's you can't just replace one baby with another no. it's just yeah so um I did get pregnant the next month or two months later and had a healthy baby and I had to deal with like the anxiety uh, and the grief kind of of that at the same time as being pregnant and it was super challenging and I remember when I dealt with the loss thinking well this is the worst thing that's ever going to happen to me um and that turned out not to be true but it did help me learn how to cope with loss and how to just take every day. And I remember my OB called me at the time and he said, you will look at this and you're going to realize like the beauty in the world. Like my wife, his wife had uh, like pretty advanced ovarian cancer. And so he said, you're going to like go out and, on a walk and look at the birds and appreciate them and just look at the world around you differently. And that was true. That was true. You just, when I was pregnant with my son after that, I was like, how am I going to get through this pregnancy without, you know, freaking out? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know everything's going to be okay. I don't know he's going to be healthy in the end. Anything could happen. And I just thought, well, today I know he's healthy. Right. Like, that's all I can go off of is what I know today. Right. And you can't control anything else, unfortunately, no. but it would just no. drive you crazy. Right. And when you say it helped you learn how to cope with loss, how did it do that? Like, do like within yourself, or did you see a therapist? Or um, I saw a therapist. She was helpful, um, but I also just like looked at quotes online. Oh, I joined a community for online of women who would lost, uh, terminated their pregnancies for medical reasons. Okay, uh, and I'm still like friends online with them today. That's great. So yeah, it was super supportive, and it was such a unique situation. Mm -hmm. And there's so much like shame and self blame. I feel like in that group, depending on what your baby's diagnosis is like for mine it was 100 percent fatal so it was almost in a weird way easier because it wasn't like well what quality of life would right they like have? a decision yeah. exactly yeah it was just but it was something i never thought i would ever be a part of and i remember justin my brother calling um and he was five years older and he called and uh, was just really sweet and comforting me he's a he was a doctor so that helped you know just saying it was going to be fine yeah and, um he was very compassionate like that so that was my first kind of dealing with grief. Um, so I wanted to go back to talk about Justin and um, what the type of person he was. And I'm just so happy to have this opportunity to talk about him because the anniversary of his death is coming up on December 10th. And it's around that time. Yeah. So I just feel like this is kind of poetic. It's like this is I'm able to give voice to him. And it's a testament to how close we were as siblings that like, I feel so driven to honor his life and his legacy. Right. Um, so we were really close growing up. He kind of was my caretaker and I worshipped him. He was like my hero. And I always thought that 
I was like his sidekick, like in the family. Like I was, it was like Justin and Jillian all the time. And I was just, we'd go to family gatherings and just like sit in the corner and giggle and stuff. And like he, he was, we just knew we were a team, like always. I think we just attached to each other and just like saw each other for who we really are. And he um, just loved me no matter what. Like when I had like a crazy eye patch on, cause like <laughs> the eye doctor made me do that stuff. Like he loved me through every phase, it didn't matter. So it was like a unconditional love. And I felt that for him also, just like, it didn't matter. I was there for him, like no matter what. And when I was having a hard time, like I was depressed in high school, he like called my mom and talked to her about it. So I could go see a therapist. Um, and just, we would just laugh. Like I remember I was telling my best friend about how uh, we got bored. I remember just being really bored in our town and running outside in the rain when it rained and just just for fun, you know, and just like just being kids. So and he was so smart. He was so smart. He he was like in gifted and did all the advanced classes and all that. But um, he was also smart in a way that was emotionally intelligent. And he would say things like, um, you know, doctors don't know nearly as much as they let on. And like, there's so much we don't know. And he just had a way of looking at like society in the world that was interesting. And he, I remember him telling me that if he was a woman, he would get breast implants, you know, <laughs> he was like, why not? Yeah. Like he was just, he was funny. He was um, just brilliant. And he was so hard on himself. He was a perfectionist. And I think that that was like really to his detriment to be so much of a perfectionist. And it didn't help to come from this culture of like pressure um, to achieve and go to an Ivy League school and um, just be the best, be the best and he be perfect. Yeah. And, um, you know, he graduated magna cum laude and then went on to medical school. And and he told me, and by the way, in all this, he told me, I don't think that I'm that smart at one point. And I was like, that's crazy. I mean, he's so smart. I couldn't do what he did. Like, he's so smart. And the fact that he per didn't perceive himself as that smart uh, it just shows kind of like how off his self-esteem was compared with like his qualities in the mm -hmm. world. So he, um, I remember him, he told me that he was suicidal once in high school, when he was in high school. And he hadn't gotten into Harvard. And so he felt like he had failed, even though he got to, into another Ivy, Ivy League school and went there, like he didn't get into that school. And I, I think he felt so much pressure to, to be perfect and to get into the best school. And so he was, I guess his, not that his, I don't want to say his priorities were off, but I mean, kind of, you know, Yeah. Uh, it was just, I felt so sorry for him. I knew that there was part of him that I could never reach. I knew that there was like a melancholy and a sadness that was just away from me and that was his own. And I knew that in order to have like a close relationship with him, I needed to just let him be like, let that be and not push him. That's how I felt anyway. Yeah. I didn't want to push him. I just like was like, I knew he had that sadness. He was, he was gay and um, it was like the nineties. And I feel like Back then, it was not the way it is now in terms of, like, acceptance. Yeah. And even just being out there and having like, politicians that are gay and just it being more accepted. So I think, and I remember when he was about 10, um, him coming home and falling on the stairs because some kid had used a gay slur on him and, like, was bullying him. And I remember him crying and crying. And it makes me so sad. This, I think think about but it's just my mom comforted him and like it just sucks that he had to deal with that you know yeah I don't think that helped and I know that like suicide rates amongst gay people is much higher um and I'm sure that that's part of why is the homophobia you know in our society so um but he came out to me when he was about 19 I think I was 14 and he came out to me first and uh, I remember him telling me like, I have someone to tell you and, and it's a big deal. And so I was like thinking, I hope he doesn't have cancer, you know? So, and he was like, I'm gay. I was like, oh, thank God. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like, I'm so happy. Like yeah. I was so afraid he had some terminal illness. 
And so, and then he was like, yeah, I, my friends at college were like, why haven't you told Jillian? Like, of course she's totally fine. Like, um, and we were so close. And then I remember him, he told my sister and then he told my brother and then he was going to tell my parents and I was the only one at home. So I remember he was like, okay, I'm going to go do it. And he went downstairs to tell them. And, uh, he told them and, um, I think that they were just kind of quiet because I don't think they were expecting it. Um, and I think they told him that they loved him, my mom, I believe. I don't know, but I wasn't there. So um, then he came up and got me. We went to like Denny's to like decompress the whole thing and like talk about it all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so um, and so then he was out at that point and uh, dating and everything. He ended up getting in a toxic relationship and um, it was very detrimental to his mental health. And it's a good example of just like ending up in a narcissistic relationship. Um, yeah. So yeah. that he, so that contributed, I'm sure to his suicide eventually. So, um, I knew that he lived, I lived in Florida and he moved to back to Florida. He had lived there for a little while and does, did his residency in Miami. And, um, he, worked there for many years. We saw each other sometimes. I had a baby and he had a, he adopted a son about the same time. And so they were close in age and we were raising them as together as we could kind of. Um, he would come up and visit. I was about four hours away. So he'd come up and visit um, and particularly towards the end when he was trying to leave his relationship, he would come visit me a lot. And then I would go, he was going through this divorce and I would go try to help him and like in support in court and testified on his behalf and stuff like that. So he, the last year or two of his life, he was uh, stressed and his, I think he felt overwhelmed, like everything was kind of falling apart. Like I think he didn't feel like he was doing a great job as a doctor. I think he didn't feel like he was doing a great job as, you know, in a relationship or as even as even a father this is just my speculation mm -hmm. and so he i think it was just this overwhelming sense that he was kind of a burden to everyone which was just his perception and and he didn't say, ever say he felt like a burden but he oh he had had previous attempts i learned that when we were in one of the court hearings um that he'd he'd thrown himself off of a balcony and broken ribs um, onto a glass table and he'd broken ribs and that was like probably 10 years before he ended up dying but it's the key part to the story because that him throwing himself off of things was like a, clearly his method of doing it and he the last couple of years I saw him we were closer because he was relying on me um, for support and other people too it, but he was started looking worse. Like he wasn't taking care of himself as much and like kind of aging quickly, which was strange. And, um, he'd always been like really fit and really kind of like, I don't know, like way neater of a person than I am. Like he was like way more of a neat freak and he ended up getting like really messy and just stuff that was odd. I know he started watching, um, the good, the good place. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that show with, with like Kristen Bell. Yes. Yeah. It's a few years mm -hmm. old. Um, but he was watching it and it's about life and death a lot. Right. And he was watching it like marathons of it towards the end. So I'm wondering now, like in retrospect, if he was just preparing himself to die, mm -hmm. you know, cause he was clearly that was on death was on his mind a lot. And like what happens? Um, and I know that he was on some type of like pills of some sort. I'm not sure what they were. He was acting different. One time I met up with him in Florida at a, uh, for Labor Day weekend, and we went to a hotel in Sarasota with our kids. And he um, started, we were at a toy shop with the boys, and he started sweating like profusely. And I was like, Justin, are you okay? Like, why are you sweating? It's not, you know, hot. Like, and he was like, oh, no, I don't feel good. I don't feel good. And then he just went back to, I was like, okay, well, why don't you just go back to the hotel and I'll watch your son like at the toy shop. So he went back to the hotel and I remember being afraid that he wasn't going to make it because he seemed off, you know, mm -hmm. like I wanted him to make it back to the hotel. And so there was some level of concern, I guess. And it was really hard, I'll say, as like someone he was leaning on to 
first of all, to watch kind of like him unravel like he did the last couple of years and also to try to give support and like almost to save someone who, who you can't save people, no. you know, and, but I was going to try. And of course, afterwards you think like, what could I have done differently? Um, and he did try calling me the day that he died and I didn't pick up and I didn't pick up cause I was at work. And I had just started back at work like full time a couple months before that. And I was like, no, like I'm at work and like I'll call him after work, you know? And and I did, but it was too late. Like, and so I've tried not to beat myself up over not picking up. But it was the last time I could have ever talked to him. But of course you don't know that. So um, let me think. So the last year of his life when he was unraveling and like he was stressed involved in this messy divorce I think it was just like the layers of of just I don't know dysfunction or stress to like piled on to each other and I know he had mindfulness cards and I tried to, to to get him to watch like youtubers that like are helpful and about like you know just being grounding yourself and all of that and he went to therapy for a little bit but I think he stopped and so I'm going to talk about the night he died because that's kind of like everything after that is like um a lot too so he I got the I was just it was like a normal I thought it was a normal day and he was planning on coming for Christmas because he used to come from to my house for Christmas every year and it was December 10th and so Christmas was a couple weeks away and he um my dad had texted me I think the night before saying can you call Justin he's having a bad day so I tried calling him multiple times and I texted him and told him he was welcome to come to my house for the weekend if he wants, or I would go to Miami if he wanted for the weekend. Like either is fine. Didn't get a response back. He, he, um, I guess according to my parents, they'd flown down to visit him to, you know, try to help him because they were worried. And he was on, he was not coherent, I believe that day, according to them. But anyway, um, oh, and the other thing too, my electricity in the room that he was going to stay in was out. So I worked at, at a solar company and there was an electrician on staff. So I asked him to come fix the electricity because my brother was coming for Christmas and um, his name was Travis. And so he agreed to do that. So I was getting ready for Justin to come. And then I get a call from my oldest brother that night that said, um, and it was late at night, so that was kind of odd. Usually he wouldn't call late. And he said, um, I think he said there's been, oh, as was Jillian, I have some really bad news. So I was bracing myself. I thought it was my parents, to be honest. Like, that would make more sense in terms of, like, age. And he said, uh, Justin committed suicide. And then he said, um, Justin committed suicide. And he said, and I just wanted to know more detail. I was thinking in my mind at the time, I was like, okay, well, I hope it just wasn't in front of his son. I hope it, he did it privately. I hope it wasn't like in front of, I hope like nothing was traumatic for my parents finding him or anything like that, you know, because he just wanted them to like minimize the damage. And unfortunately, Alan told me how it happened, which was that he threw himself off of a, his apartment building as a high rise in Miami off of the balcony and like felt his death while my dad grabbed his ankle and tried to hold on and couldn't hold on. And um, my mom and his son were in the apartment. So he did end up like committing suicide in front of my parents. And um, that was just something that I And I, I can tell you what my reaction was. I said, I'm sick of this fucking family fucking up my life. And I hung up the phone. And that's because I wanted, I was like, I have this life here in Florida that like I'm working for the solar company and like have my kids and, you know, do pole fitness or whatever and like doing my little thing. And like, then I was like, oh, like this is huge. I knew that this was going to change the trajectory of like everything. So sleep is just the first thing to go when you like have trauma, at least for me. So sleep went immediately. I knew I wasn't going to really be able to sleep. And I went outside my house and I, I didn't know what to do. 
I just went, there's like this little triangle in front of my house. I just like kind of walked around it. And it was so weird because I was hit with shock and grief, but I was also hit with this overwhelming sense of like freedom, like freedom from expectations. Like Justin had just done the most antisocial thing that anyone can do, you know, besides like murdering someone, but he'd just done this thing that was like so against how we were raised because it was so like horrible and just sad and um and then I was like oh the pressure is off like like Justin I don't know it's so weird just like no I think it makes sense does I feel it like too because you probably without even knowing it but you probably had this sense of um like you probably felt like you always had to be there to try to like you said like fix him yeah and help him yes so and I don't think that there's I don't think that that's a bad thing or a wrong thing to say that you felt that sense of freedom because I yeah. think in the back of your mind you probably always felt like you have to hold him together in some way or try another. to yeah yeah like I wasn't the only one um trying to do that yeah you know my mom he would talk with, to my mom on the phone every day and it's a lot I think knowing that someone is in a dark place and yeah. that you can't fix it yeah is hard that's and exactly it, it take, right yeah it, it takes a lot out of you yeah it does. And, and I didn't even realize it because I think it had always been that way. Yeah. So you don't even have really perspective on it. Right. Yeah. But I mean, I thought of it just, I loved him so much. So like anything was, felt like a blessing with right. him to me. So it wasn't a burden. Like I just seen him for Thanksgiving. I had just seen him. And right before that, we'd gone to Universal together, uh, which was really fun. And, but also he was off then. I knew he was off when at Universal. And when you say that your parents said he wasn't coherent, yeah. Like, do you think that was because of dr- pills? Like, pills yeah. Or okay. Something, something. And I yeah. don't know specifically what. Okay. But I think he was like, my dad's coping mechanism during that time, like when he died, was to take notes all the time, which is kind of like a journaling. Yeah. But my dad would never call it that in a million mm-hmm. years. But that, I think that was his, it was a healthy coping mechanism, which was to write like, so, you know, like that he was disheveled and then this happened and then this happened and then. You know, just the the days afterward were such a blur of having to kind of keeping everything together yeah. and just sort through all of his, I don't know, like his life and kind of close it out in a weird way, like right. his apartment and just everything. And so, and his son, of course, but like, so they, I feel like they, um, my dad was just writing like everything that had to be done all the time. Um, and so... The night after, oh, and my friends came over. I want to say that too. Um, that night when when he died, I texted two of my friends uh, who live nearby and said, Justin, I just found out Justin committed suicide. And, um, and they were just like, oh my God, oh my God, like, what do you need? And I said, I don't know what I need because I didn't know what I needed. Yeah. And then they just came over, which was so sweet. <laughs> and they took me out and like, I just, my boys were sleeping, so... I didn't want my boys to find out until the next day um, until I could process it a little bit and how to tell them. Not that that gives me a lot of time to process, but a little bit. And this is the part that I did that like, I'm just like, why did I do this? But I went to work the next day. <laughs> like I worked. Now, why did I work? Because like this, I was like, what a psychopath. Why was I working? And it was because like I could have gone immediately to Miami, but I didn't because I I just wanted one more day to say goodbye to my life. Like I wanted one day to be like, this is my old life that I'm saying goodbye to and I'm entering into this new one where Justin committed suicide. Like I knew that. So that's what I did. But of course I couldn't make it through the whole day like normal. (laughs) I just experienced something insane. So I was at the solar company and this woman, this one of my coworkers said, are you okay? Like your eyes look red. And I was like, my brother died yesterday, and then I cried. And then I got it together again and wasn't crying. And then uh, Travis, the guy who's going to fix the electricity, came over, and he was like, hey, when do you want me to come this weekend to like work on the electricity? And then I, I go, he's not coming anymore. And I cried. And I was like, oh, my gosh. That's so, like, of course, like, it was too much to try, yeah. you know, to work. But um, then I went to Miami, and I had to. I had to tell everyone at my job what happened. And I just, I didn't been there that long. So I didn't feel really comfortable being like, hi, like my brother just committed suicide. <laughs> like, But it is what it is. So I went to Miami and I was just flying back and forth there a lot. I remember seeing, seeing my parents 
in his apartment for the first time, seeing his partner at the time, because he had a new partner who um, I'm still friends with, and I'm going to see next weekend, actually. And uh, just my cousin was there, and my aunt had flown down. Uh, and so my we just all hugged and just, just in shock. And then the next day, I think, or the day after, my um, bestie, my ride-or-die bestie, who's here, um, came down and reminded us to eat meals. You know, hey, it's time for lunch, everyone. Come on, because we're all in this fog. Right. And also my sister came down, and I just remember hugging my sister for the first time, and it was just like this fierce hug. Like, it was just like, this is us now, you know? I mean, and my other brother, but it's crazy, you know? You just... It's just an intensity, and this remains today with my family, where they're, we treat each other now with like an appreciation and a gentleness that was not there before. It's like a delicacy, mm-hmm. you know. We're a lot more delicate with each other than we were before, um, which I guess is like a little bit of a silver lining. Then after he died, uh, oh, it was about to be Christmas, so we still had to deal with Christmas, which was two weeks later, mm-hmm. and his son too, because we knew. Um, we probably wouldn't get to see his son much longer because of his messy divorce situation. And how old was his son? His son was 11. Okay. Um, I went to his 11th birthday, but anyway, where was I? So, Oh, Christmas. So, um, I had, we're decorating for, for Justin to come at my house, but I couldn't, now I can't have Christmas. Am I going to have Christmas just without Justin there? Like, that's crazy. So what, like what to do? My brother and sister were up and back up in Massachusetts at that point where they live, and my parents were in Miami. So I was like not wanting them to spend Christmas alone with Justin's son right after their son had just committed suicide in front of them. Yeah. So I was like, I need to be there for them. Uh, so I, and I was still trying to work and everything. So I went to Cracker Barrel and went and bought like a bunch of gifts from that store and packed them in a suitcase and took them to Miami. And we were staying at like a Marriott there and asked the, asked the staff to put out the Christmas presents for them. So they did that. I have pictures, you know, from that, Mm -hmm. that time where they're sitting under the tree at the Marriott, like opening gifts because their uncle had just committed suicide two weeks before. And it was just crazy. And I was telling my friend who's a therapist about it. And she said, you know what, that's one day they'll realize that you still had a Christmas for them, which is really sweet Mm -hmm. because it's true. Like it was like, how do you still like in a time of crisis like that? Like, how do you keep it together? How do you still celebrate something? Yeah, anything. And with my parents, too, they were there and we all had like Christmas lunch there. It was so surreal. Um, Then the next thing after that was planning his service. And so I... I said to the rest of my immediate family, like, I want to plan his service because I feel like this is something I can do for him because I knew he wouldn't want like a Catholic service that we just how we were raised to like, you know, my mom is very Catholic, but, um, so I decided to, we had it at Naples hospital where he worked sometimes. And I decided to have it be like, be about meditation and mindfulness and have like a Tibetan bowl, like, um, there and, play Enya and just um, have everyone that like loved him come. And his his um, per- person he was divorcing, the man he was divorcing, um, actually cremated him and kept the ashes. So we don't have a grave or his body. And my, my parents like never got his body or anything. And so we did the service um, and we each spoke about him. And actually what I said then is relevant now because what I said then is I'm, this is not my end and I'm not going to you know, hold my head underwater. I'm going to live, but I'm going to live for us. And so that's what I'm doing even by doing this podcast is I'm living for him and me yeah. and giving him a voice where he can't. And after that, we, oh, and something about my friends too, who just, I would not have gotten through all this if not for my friends. And, you know, someone that I didn't even invite, like, not on purpose, but just, like, hadn't mentioned it to her was, like, can I come? Like, I want to come to the service. Like, 
and she came she drove there and everything and it's just like people who showed up at that time like meant so much and I wasn't really able to articulate it to them at the time because I was just dealing in shock but they it people who sent notes to me afterwards and said like one of his good friends from childhood sent me this note Anne is her name and she said you know your home was a respite for Justin whenever he talked about it he talked about it so fondly at the end and I never said anything to her like thank you I never responded and like I'm saying thank you because <laughs> like that meant a lot and like but I was just in this weird numb state or maybe I just yeah. don't like writing thank you notes to people <laughs> but that's my excuse but it was and did that and then also um, a couple like uh, some relatives and friends of his were like you know there was not a conversation with him where your name wouldn't come up like he just loved you so much and something else someone said was like but you guys were so close like as if like I would have an explanation for then why he I was like yeah we were I don't know <laughs> like I didn't throw myself off the building he did so he um it was just nice to know that like that was people understood that and that just that I was a comfort to him at the end, even though I couldn't save him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so after the service, um, then I had, to, that's the hard part, I think, in my opinion, like when, how do you like, after all the hubbub and everything, like planning it is gone and you're just left with your grief and other people kind of, kind of move on on some level, like how do you cope? Right. And then COVID happened. So that was December 10th, 2019. And COVID was, you know, like February, March of that year. And it was just like, uh, COVID almost like helped delay my grief because it was like, we're in survival mode now. Like, remember, we all thought it was like going to be a plague or something mm -hmm. at first. And I was like, how are my kids going to survive? I like, I started having them start watching Survivor so they would learn how to make fires mm -hmm. and stuff. Because I was like, <laughs> who knows? Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so COVID kind of took over and it was like, I don't know, it was just everything was so immediate. So it was like, I couldn't really process the mm -hmm. Justin situation. And then I started going to therapy and um, that was good. That was really good. That's, that's like what started my journey of like healing was like therapy. Oh, pole fitness too. I have to keep saying that because, uh, and I told them by the way that I was going to mention it because like just the get myself my body being strong and then being only around women who like support each other no matter what was like just really healthy and good for me yeah um and just i had a pole in my house and i like learned how to invert which is like putting your like body over you so you're like upside down mm -hmm. and that was you know just stuff like that like just help i know it's like little things but yeah help. No, that's important though. it is important and going on walks with my kids to the gas station like by the house mm -hmm. <laughs> like that was huge um just like and just trying to talk to them and oh that's another thing my kids my kids like just having to get up every morning and like function and function for them and wanting wanting their lives to not be like screwed up from trauma um that's huge and i don't know what state i would be in if i didn't have them so my other brother i okay so there's four of us my other brother he's 10 years older than me and I get a call from my sister late at night. Once again, it's like a late night phone call. So now I'm really like paranoid about late night phone calls because right. I'm like, okay, what am I going to find out? And it was my sister telling me that Alan, our brother, uh, was in the emergency room um, and he'd had a brain aneurysm and they didn't know if he was going to make it through the night. And he ended up being in a medical coma I think it was the next morning they put him in medical coma. They had to do surgery on his brain in order to put a stent in his brain. Um, and there he happened to be, he was very lucky. He was at his apartment um, with his girlfriend and he all of a sudden had like the worst headache of his life, according to him. And apparently uh, she was saying, she told me later, she was like, and he was throwing up everywhere. And he goes, well, I was dying. So that's why. Yeah. So, and so she called, she didn't know who to call. She said, should I call your parents? Do I call your daughter? Like, who am I supposed to call? And he was like, 911 was what he could say. Mm -hmm. And so she called 911 and he was right by um, UMass Medical Center, which uh, is a really good facility. So that saved his life, I think. Mm -hmm. And he went there. He had the, the, there happened to be a neurosurgeon on staff that knew how to do that. Um, 
put this dent in and everything. And this is my understanding of it, by the way. So it's not like a medical yeah. opinion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I, you know, my dad's a doctor, so he'd probably be like, well, actually, it's this. Right. So I don't know. This is just what I know. And uh, I was in Florida, so I flew up the next day. And it was just crazy because it's like, how can we be going through this again is how it felt. Like, mm-hmm. here we go again. But now Alan? Like, what? Like, and then... We, I was with my parents, going to drive out to the hospital to see them, and my dad had to bring the paperwork for the power of attorney and the healthcare proxy, which may or may not be the same thing. I'm not totally sure. But basically, my brother was signing his rights over his body and his financials over to my dad. Um, and he was on... He When I saw him, he was in the neuro ICU, and he had tubes like in his like a drain um in his skull to make sure that it there wasn't too much fluid and like too much pressure I think and just watching my dad sign those you know or bring them over to Alan to sign and watching Alan sign them was just awful because I was just like how can this be happening it was like this shock and it's like that and this happened to me with the baby too when I found out that he had the fatal diagnosis. It was like it was like you start at least for me. It's like you start watching a movie of your life. It's like it doesn't feel like you some you almost like leave your body a little bit and you're like, "Oh, I'm just watching this happen to me." It's yeah. like dissociating a little bit as a coping mechanism, mm-hmm. I think. So and also I just want to say like I don't understand why Alan was considered like coherent enough to sign that because he was on a bunch of oxy like in the neuro ICU he had just had an aneurysm and like he's signing away those papers and I'm like this is weird but anyway uh he my dad made the very smart medical decision for him um where they were deciding I think that night the night of the aneurysm what to do and the surgeon had said well I could go in this way and like there's a very good chance he'll live but um the aneurysm was close to the speech center of his brain, so he'll likely never speak again. And I guess one of his kids or someone in the room or something was like, oh, that might, like, maybe we should do that because, like, obviously they want him to live. And my dad was like, no, we're going to try another way. And that ended up being good because Alan is now re- fully recovered. Amazing. It is amazing. Yeah. And I went, during that time, I went to, we all vacation in Cape Cod every year. Like, the family has a reunion there. And... I was I went and got a massage when I was at Cape Cod and the woman said to me I told her just about the whole thing Justin and Alan and she she said you know your brother Justin won't let anything happen to to your other brother like he's not going to you know he's going to be he's watching over him he'll be okay and that was like really reassuring and I just wonder if that really like kind of yeah did happen in a way cuz not many people recover like he did from that Right. Like usually there's some type of major impairment or or they die. And he fought through it. And I remember going to Alan and seeing him, you know, when he's in the neuro ICU with the drain coming out. And he said to me, for the first thing he did was apologize. He said, I'm so sorry. Like, I'm so sorry. And I was like, it's okay. You didn't choose this. Mm-hmm. Like, like, you don't have to apologize. But he was sorry because he knew how much our our family had just been through and was like, I don't want to be putting everyone through trauma and stress again. That's like, you know, but, and then he looked at the other thing I remember strongly is that he looked at me and he was like, I'm going to make it through this. And like the intensity in his eyes at that time, he was just like, this isn't going to be the end. Like, like I'm going to survive this. And like, I really admire him for that. Cause like, that's really badass that he just like, recovered from a brain aneurysm you know I was thinking I was like he could be a guest on this and be like my one brother committed suicide and then I recovered from brain aneurysm because that's like crazy and like um it's just and he's fine he's he's teaching now he's teaching he has a girlfriend he's got kids he's like totally fine they came and visited me in Florida I introduced her to pole fitness too (laughs) because I drag everyone to it um but yeah so I mean that's kind of a beautiful thing and then, oh, actually, when he and his girlfriend came down to visit in Florida, um, I had decided to adopt some kittens. And this is because a friend of mine, uh, I think it was May, like, 20, 
22, I believe. Um, her daughter, who's 13, committed suicide. And um, I knew that I could be a resource for her because of what I'd been through. Uh, Cause not very many people are part of this club. Like, and so I was like, I was like, okay, I can turn my pain into like at least being able to help someone going through something that I can't even fathom. Like I can't fathom that, like what she yeah. is dealing with and dealt with. Like it's just in insane. So uh, she said that her daughter, who is also like Justin, by the way, like super, super smart, super smart and artistic. And Justin was always very artistic growing up. Uh, and then he chose like a career path that didn't necessarily like lend itself to art. Mm -hmm. But, um, and this little girl was also very artistic, very smart, very sensitive. And I think the world was too harsh for her also. I'm not sure, but she had two kittens and, her mom mentioned it to me that she had two kittens that she was looking to adopt out now. And, um, I said, I'll take your kittens. So that's how I got, um, Oso and Camilo. Aww. Yeah. So, um, and now my boys have kittens and like yeah. my middle son loves them. And like, it's like, at least that's something I would not have gotten yeah. the kittens otherwise, you know, and it brings joy from yes. a dark, sad situation. Yes. You know? Yeah, one of the cat, one of the cats is like really scared of everything. So I always think like maybe he has PT. I've like so analyzed the cats. Yeah. I'm like maybe he has PTSD from like when she died. I don't know, but they're sweet. And um, you know, I like that it's two of them. Just like there was like my brother and this little girl. You know, yeah. and so um, so yeah, Alan recovered from his aneurysm, and I have now since then been diagnosed um, with therapy, and then also just like through my regular doctor with like complex PTSD. So um, like I knew when I found out about Alan's aneurysm, like, okay, sleep went again. Okay, I'm not going to sleep. Like I just know now when like things come up that I'm just not going to, you know, sleeping and eating get kind of fall by the wayside and or I just have to pay a lot of attention to if I've had a meal or not and just try to like have one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just the basics are like showering and all that, just basic self-care. And so – with the complex PTSD, how that's affected me is, like, I um, I have nightmares, like, bad nightmares sometimes. I um, really startle at, like, loud noises. Like, I know most people do, but it's, like, I get freaked out. And, like, um, I went to the movies and saw Shazam with my boys. Mm -hmm. And there was a, in a, there was a scene at the beginning where someone walks off of a roof and commits suicide. And I was triggered for like three days after that. Like oh, I sure. yeah. could not handle it. And I was like, I was like, I realized what was happening. And I like held my boys close to me. Like, like they were going to be affected in the same way. And they're not to me. Who was like, I just, it was like three. I even had to tell my boss at work, like, Hey, like, I'm just a little off. Like, just so you know. So that type of stuff, like getting triggered like that is just, you never know where it's going to come from. Right. But it's getting better because I'm in therapy and I have a, a therapist that specializes in trauma. So that's been really huge. Like I would just recommend to anyone going through anything close to like what I've been through or dealing with grief or loss of anyone, like just therapy. <laughs> I know it's like so cliche and basic, but it's just it helps, like, right? it's so helps. And it helps with your self-awareness too. Cause the first thing is like recognizing when you're triggered and when like, okay, I'm not myself right now. I'm dysregulated. And like, okay, how do you get regulated again? Um, you can, you know, do deep breathing or go on a walk or just there's a variety of things to try to calm yourself or talk to a friend. Um, that's been my other thing is I have a friend that I go every week with to coffee and we've done it for since she was having a bad time with her boyfriend like six years ago or something. Mm -hmm. We've done it every week. And that's like, great. she just texted me this morning. She was like, love you. It's going to yeah. go great. Yeah. So um, people like that, things like that, just like you can count on um, no matter what has Absolutely. been huge. Yes. Um, and I think just female friendship, even when I was a child, like I had close female friends and they have gotten me through like so much. It's, it's just, I can't say enough about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's not enough kind of like out there about how important it is for us to have that. Like a support system. A, yeah, support yeah. system, which I definitely feel like I have now. Mm -hmm. Oh, and so um, in terms of my own therapy, one of my therapists like said to me after I dealt with 
the suicide and the aneurysm was like, you know, art is going to like, he did this analysis of me and like, basically it was like, you're an adventurer, which is true. That's why I'm here. Uh, and, uh, and a helper and an artist. And he said, art will help you through this. And he was right. And so I thought of it as my dancing. Cause I was like, Oh, well I love dancing. So that's my art. But, um, I started working for a photographer as an assistant and I loved it. I just loved it. Like I loved, I was fascinated by like everything he was doing. He did, he was a wedding photographer, uh, in South Tampa. And like, so I was just fascinated by it, but like, I didn't really like him so much. Like he was kind of, he was like really harsh. He wasn't great with like people, but he was very like his, his actual product I admired mm -hmm. and his job I admired. Right. And then I realized that I was like, Oh, but I don't really like him. He's like, um, kind of derogatory towards women and like just kind of would make gross comments about yeah. women and stuff. And I was just, and, and other races and stuff. And I was just like, ew, like, I don't really like this person. So I was like, but wait, I was like, and he kept telling me he would train me. And then he kind of like never prioritized that. So I was like, wait, I'm going to have to take this into my own hands. Like mm -hmm. I'm going to have to train myself. So I actually hired a, um, advertising for retired advertising photographer to train me. So he's trained me and I, um, just have done photography. I love it. And I was telling this podcast actually has to do with it because I went to my favorite neighborhood coffee shop <laughs> and I said to the guy, the guy was asking me like, what's up? I was like, I'm going to be on a podcast. And he was like, why? And I was like, so I had to tell him why. Mm -hmm. So the story is like, all this personal stuff about my life. And I always liked this guy who was like the nice coffee shop guy, but he didn't know anything about my personal life. Well, I told him the whole story of my brothers and he was like, oh, well, do you want, you know, to have a show here? Cause they have art on their walls there. And I was like, yes. So like in December, they're going to have my work. And the, and then I was getting my hair done and I'm friends with my hairdresser. And she goes, she said she was like, oh, you should you should have an opening, like an mm -hmm. opening party. Yeah. And I was like, I should. So the opening party is happening um, on Saturday. That's so exciting. Sa this Saturday. Yeah, my parents are flying down for it. Mm -hmm. And um, my sister's flying down for it uh, to support me. And I have my friends coming out and everything. There's going to be wine and appetizers. And I'm going to have all my artwork up. And That's then awesome. it's so cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so this is how Jenny comes into it because Jenny was my – brother Justin's friend and she would help watch his son while he was working in the hospital because she worked there too and she um is having a baby and she's naming the baby Justin yeah. and her um her baby shower happens to be the day after my opening so my parents are going to be down here so we can all go yeah like isn't that crazy That's incredible like when the universe is like comes it to all you, aligns it's insane yeah and like, that was like, when I realized that I was just like, oh, I felt like I've been losing for so long. Mm -hmm. I just felt like, like, this is hard. Like, no one told me life was going to be this hard. Like, not that, I mean, life is hard for everyone. But like, I was just like, like, when is this going to end? I think too, when you have a lot of negatives back to back. Yes. When there's finally so many positives that yes. happen back to back, you're like, finally, it's yes. like the light at the end of the tunnel, yes. you know? Um, I do have a question though, yeah. if you're comfortable answering. So your brother's son, yeah. How is how did he do with everything? Um, we uh, unfortunately his, um, I don't know. Okay. Because he th that was the last that we were able to see him. Um, his current his his other parent has like kind of cut off contact. Wow. So I kind of knew that was going to happen, um, just based off of like previous yeah. relation their relationship. So I. Like, I remember I was putting all of our contacts into his phone and stuff right before uh, it was like that Christmas I was yeah. telling you about. And before we said goodbye and it was just, there was nothing, just knowing that it was another loss, I guess, but. And hopefully one day. Yes. I, yes. I definitely think that when the time comes, that will come full circle too. I, I do. hope so. I do. I think so. I don't think that that's the end, yeah, you know? No. Yeah. And I think, too, a way to look at it and have hope is, like, you were so close with your brother. Yeah. And that is a child that he raised. Or yes. Helped raise, so yes. you can only hope and pray that he has some of your brother's yes. traits. And My nephew would, yeah. said that, actually. He yeah. said he had, you know, 10, 11 years of Justin. Right. Like, let's not forget that. Right. And that's true. And I think sometimes when you're when you're young, 
and you do have the influence of, you know, only one person or it can be confusing. So I think that it, sometimes it takes until you're a little bit older and wiser and more life has happened that you start to seek out, you know, family and other people, you know, I I think that that. Yeah. I think that that will happen. I think it'll happen too, particularly like, um, cause you know, my son is the same age as him and stuff like that. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. And, and that was why part of why I put my kids in therapy. Well, for all of these reasons, but also because they have to be confused. Okay. So our uncle and cousin was in our lives and you know, pretty frequently. And then all of a sudden, and I think that's so important because, you know, I, from like me losing a parent at a young age, I feel like if I would have had therapy right after that yeah. things could have gone differently and really? I'm like I'm yeah and I'm I'm I'd like to say I'm fine now but there's definitely I definitely think that it's very important to sort through as part of why you're doing what you're doing don't you think I don't know oh I'm sure like how, okay think? was it your mom or your dad my dad it was your dad yeah I, mean, I can't imagine what impact that would have yeah. how old were you I was 12 I think 12 maybe yeah that's so hard um but I think that I never really coped or dealt with it. I think that it happened. I yeah. cried. And then I, I was young. So I think I just kind of like. When well, you don't know. Right. I brushed yeah. it on the rug. I moved on. And then my grandfather passed away shortly after. Oh, and geez. you hear it. You deal with it in that moment. And then I think I never really fully. Coped dealt with it. And dealt yeah. With it. Yeah. And I think that that's just been something that I. A lot of things I do in the ways that I am today. Like I feel like I'm, I can be such a loving person, but then sometimes when it comes to family, I notice that I, not intentionally, but I kind of distance myself, and I think right. it's that fear of like I already know what it feels like to lose someone close, and I don't right. want to be that close because yes. I don't want to, you know. And I think that's something I've it's realized. It's like an avoidant attachment yeah. style, or and something. I, I've, I've noticed that as I've gotten older. Um, it's really interesting to me, and it's sad, but and it's funny because when you said about the late night phone calls, you know, yeah. when I. I don't think that's something that ever goes away, you know, and I think when I get weird phone calls at certain times, when my mom calls me early. Someone unusual, yeah. Early in the morning. I'm just like, it's it it gives you that kind of eerie, like, is everything okay feeling? Yeah, like like, that tension. Yeah, I think if somebody hasn't really experienced or felt that loss, it's not really a thought that would have that wouldn't be the first thought which that goes is nice your head. yeah for them yeah but yeah I, I even know it with my parents I can tell with my parents when I call them and like they're not expecting it or right. something that they're just like hi like yeah. is everything okay mm-hmm. you know and it's like I'm I oftentimes I'm like I'm fine everything's fine right you know and I think too when it comes to, to grief and, and loss and all that stuff it's it does become that kind of not a burden, but like you're like, Ugh, again, you know what yes. I mean? It's, it's, that is such right. a good description it, of it. That's what it starts you're like, to like, oh, feel. come on. Right. Like you don't even want to hear it. It's like, yeah. what you don't know can't hurt you. So just don't even tell me. Yeah. Like, that's just what I think it, it becomes because you, you know what that feels like. And it's just such a shitty, painful thing. And it does change your life. It, it changes everything. It does. So, yes. And even if yes. your routine doesn't change, mentally no. everything changes. Yes. So. Yes. At least like I was able to, upon hearing about Justin's death, like be like, okay, everything is going to change now. I was just trying to like kind of grasp, okay, everything is different. The but world is like shifted. it seems like you're such a self-aware person. That I try. It's like you, you really, I feel like I don't know how else you could have gone about handling that situation in any other way for yourself and for your children. Like I think you did all the. Yeah. You took all the steps that you could, though. I I did. You know. Gosh, it was hard. It's like now I look back because I'm starting to, like I said, like I feel like I'm starting to win again. You know. Mm -hmm. And I look back and I'm like, and people say to me like, "Oh, what you're doing is like." inspiring or I can't even believe it how far you've come in such a short period of time and it's like I can't even look at it like even I can't even kind of look at what I've been through I can't even really look at like the aneurysm on top of the suicide because like I'll get overwhelmed yeah. Like sometimes, you know, when you look at it and you're like, holy shit, it's a like, lot. That's a lot. Right. Whereas like if I just keep going, like you're talking about, yep. just like, don't even think about it. Yeah. Just, just keep it. going. Yep. And that's, it, I've it's done the easier. Same. It's easier. It is easier, but not probably in the long run. No, probably not. Like, it's not the best thing for you. Both of us you, had but... cried for two months in our beds. Mm-hmm. We would have been like, exactly. No, through. exactly. I don't know. Because sometimes too, I notice when I'm crying about something else, I feel like I'm crying about everything yes. at once. You are. Um, yes. But that's what it feels like. But I was going to say too, that I feel like something that you might not even realize is by you sharing this story, not only is it a voice for yourself and your experience and your brother, but also there's so many people that have experienced, you know, suicide yeah. from loved ones, whether it was a partner or a child or a parent. And I feel like that that's something that it's hard to find someone else that can relate to that and yes. feel that. So I think, and I, I always say it's amazing. The, 
one of the things that's so amazing about social media, which I, I'm not a huge fan, surprisingly. I think it's like a love-hate relationship it that is, everyone has with it. It is. It. Yeah. And, but I think that like imagine like years ago, like back in the day, like when we were all young. I mean, I know I'm, I'm still young, but like yeah. when everybody was younger and dealing with things, like how kids can have this now, like these platforms where if you yes. look something up, yes. you can actually sit and listen to someone else's experience. Ex- like, I feel like that wasn't really, I mean, I remember, Available. yeah, yes. it wasn't. And I, I remember wasn't. too, like when I was young and de- I mean, this is small, but like dealing with breakups and I was Googling things, oh, right. yeah. but it's like you, Google is just, it's all over the place. Right. But to be able to have this kind of show to look through and see like, wow, that's somebody that I experienced something like that. Like yes. they can relate. And it's like almost talking to a friend or hearing uh-huh. somebody else that's been through something similar. So that's something too that I always tell my guests that come on, I'm like, when you're sharing these stories, there are definitely people out there. And I've, I've realized even more so recently, um, so many people will tell me that they relate with so many of the stories, even if it isn't the exact same thing. Right. But it's like something that you've felt, Yeah, they might have felt, even if it's a completely different circumstance. Right. So I, I just think that, that can really help people not feel alone. Yes. Um, and it's right. You know, I, I think that there's times too that if you're just, there could be people just listening and then they could hear your story and be like, wow, like I get that. I felt yeah. that. You know what I mean? It feels good not to feel alone. And I think we live in a world where it's very easy to feel like you're the only one. Like feeling isolated. A, yeah, feeling yeah. a certain way. But in reality, I think we all feel shitty one yes. way or another we at some point. We all feel like yep. shitty. We all feel like shame. We all feel like pain yeah. and loneliness beat ourselves up beat all our, of it. Yes. Yeah. like I'm not good enough or whatever mm-hmm. it is and I certainly had an like throughout the last four years I moments of like despair and moments of like worthlessness and like what yeah. is the point of anything type stuff right but I was just able to get out of it like I'd say the main thing is just like to keep going mm-hmm. <laughs> just keep going yeah like you just keep going and like when I wouldn't feel like it I would still do the things like eat healthy like I've actually, oh, that's things another. Things you can control. The things you can yeah. control, yeah. And like exercise or go on a walk or whatever it is, like, or um, just the things that even if you don't feel like doing them, if you know that like, okay, if I do these things, I'll probably feel better. It, and it, it is true. Like <laughs> it, it is sounds true. funny, but like half the time I don't want to do the good things right. and I do them Me and too. I'm like, all right, I feel accomplished. Yes. You know what I mean? But no, that's important. It's Particularly really like important. exercise. Like, yep. you know, just physiologically, it's really good for yeah. you. Yeah. And, and I want to say too, just, Kind of going back, because I know that you had said if, you know, when he, your brother had called you the day that he yes. committed suicide. Yes. And I, I just want to say that, because I know that that, I feel like as humans, that's something we do is we look at what can we, what uh, could we, we have, done, have done. Yeah. And we beat ourselves up. But yes. I feel like too, you guys obviously had a very close relationship. And I think that what he chose to do you can't take it personally or put it on your plate. No, it was about him. It was. And I think that he was just probably, he was dealing with his own battles. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, obviously. And, and I feel like too, it's so easy for us to beat ourselves up, but he loved you so much. I know. You know, and, and you guys, no matter what he was going through, you know, you got, don't ever forget the relationship you guys had. Like, don't let anything. Diminish it. Yes. No, I, I, like, and it, it, it's a horrible tragedy. Yeah. You know, and uh, it's it's heartbreaking, but that doesn't change anything else. Right. I mean, that came it before, right. but who he was. Or even after, because now yeah. it's like you, I feel like you're shedding this beautiful light in his memory and on his name, and that's all you can do. And it's like, mm-hmm. that was only, that was just one dark part of his story. That's true. You know, that you I really mean? get it because yeah. it was just, and like, it's easy, I think, for, for everyone who knew him to focus on the tragedy aspect right. of or like he did that and now he's just gone but yeah it doesn't have to be that way no you're 100 yeah. percent right yeah and it's like that's what the more that i focus on when and my mom has said this too like when he was alive and just the good parts about like him being alive and being with him and what that was like like that's better for all of us i feel like but it's hard to do well, also look at what it's done now for your family like i feel like it's it's allowed you guys to learn to be more gentle with one that's another true. and be closer and and then even with, was it your friend that you said her daughter committed mm-hmm. suicide? Yeah, like it, it allowed you to be able to relate to someone else. Yes. And to help and bring light into that situation. And, yes. and then adopt these kittens. And it's like, it's small things, but I feel like it really does all tie together. Yes. She wants to listen to this, by the way. Oh, good. Yes. Really? Yeah, she's planning on yeah. listening to it. That's so, great. um, yeah, that's, and then that's the, oh, I was going to tell you about this dream too I had. 
um, recently. And it was about, I was, and I know people talk about their dreams as boring, but this is actually relevant because I was uh, with my parents in the dream and Justin, and it, I was at a museum, which is something they used to drag us to all the time mm-hmm. growing up. And uh, he and I were talking, just a normal conversation we would have just about like how some of aspects of religion can be absurd. That's what we were talking about, which is something we totally would have talked about. And I had a camera around my neck and uh, he was, he was healthy and he was good. And we were just, and I was like, look, mom, Justin's here. He's here. Like, can't you see that he's here? And like, um, and so like I, I woke up and like, I knew that he was like here. That makes any sense. And like, I told my friend, the therapist about this also. And she said, um, that's, that's like the way of, like the universe telling you that like Justin approves of what you're doing and like he is proud of you yeah it's gonna make me cry again but that's like no it's true though and I think too like when we have dreams about people that we've lost it almost allows it gives us the sense of like they're still there it's almost like a comfort yes I felt good Mm -hmm. like I've had dreams with him and and they don't feel good yeah it might feel like weird or negative or sad or something but the those kind of dreams, I think it is a, it's a sign in a way. Yeah. And it, it, even if people don't think it is, who gives a shit? Because you can take it. Yeah, exactly. And like, if it makes them. you feel good and better about it, then that's all that matters. Yes. And, and it does. And it's like, um, it's like I'm can do, and this is what I posted recently about my show, but like I can do with my photography and like I can live with like an art form in a way that he was never able yeah, to. And too. so it makes it like, like I'm doing it for both of us almost in, and it just feels just really beautiful. Yeah, and I think too, carrying someone's memory yeah. is constantly keeping them, like a, a very positive memory of them. Yes. And I think you did such a great job of explaining and describing who he was. And I think too, everybody faces demons in life yes. and hardship and obstacles. I think like we were kind of saying before, it's just unfortunately, some people can get through it and some people can't. Yeah. And I think that when you just beat yourself up so much, it can just feel easier. Just be like, I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. Like it's, this is too painful. Yeah. This and is I too think hard. a lot of people don't understand that, but I think a lot of people also do. Yeah. Um, and I think you don't have to be hating life or suicidal to know that life can be shit. And yeah. Hard. For everyone. Yeah. I mean, everyone's going to have their challenges. Be something. Yes. Yes. And that's what my therapist said to me. She goes, I hate to break it to you, Jillian, but you're always going to have problems. No, always. There's like, always, you always have something. problems. It's yeah. always something, but it's just getting through it. And I, and like you said, I think it's amazing. You know, you have these beautiful children to yes. live for and, you know, and his memory. And it's like, it's just, it's a constant, constant reminder. I feel like of why you should keep going yes. and bring positivity to the situation yeah sure. and, and i wanted to say too like about suicide specifically like something that um, my friend who lost her daughter and i have talked about is like the stigma associated with it and how much we hate that stigma and how there's so much judgment for someone who's committed suicide oh, yeah. and how that's not helping anyone no and i think too it's not something like i said whether you understand it or not it happened that person was suffering yes that and was i don't their think pain. it's right and i don't think it's meant <laughs> to be understood no like at all and I, I we believe it or not like there is a lot of good in the world but we live in a very evil world yes so it's like i can't even i mean right i don't think you're we're not supposed to understand how someone could take their own life but we're also not supposed to judge it like you said right Yes, because I haven't been in that level of pain. Right. So why do I claim to understand what he was going through? Yeah. And obviously, and you don't know. No one yeah. knows. No. Yeah. No. No one knows. No one knows. And so, and I think it's just people try to seek answers, or it makes it easier to deal with, like, oh, well, they were just doing a bad thing, or they're going to burn in hell, well, or whatever. Something that I hate. Oh, well, I don't. I don't like the word hate, but something that I highly dislike is yeah. when people say that suicide is selfish, like. I don't think that they're really... Yeah, they do say that. Yeah, and I, I don't think people are really thinking about... I think it's selfish to make that comment. Right. Because, because it, what you don't know what someone was going through. No. And while, yes, it hurts everyone around them, they were hurting too. A lot. Yeah, and yeah. I don't think I don't think there are enough resources. And an, I don't think there is any solution or fix. I mean, therapy is great. Right. It can help a lot of people. But even there's people that might try every solution and still just be so miserable yeah, and decide to do something like that. And that's why I think that with Justin, I'm like, 
uh, I've come to the point where I'm like, maybe he just wasn't meant to be here like any longer than he was. Mm -hmm. Like, because if he was meant to be here, he would be. And he's not. I think too, in a way, like I kind of mentioned before, unfortunately, I think when, when people do take their own lives, it almost does, what it should do is instead of, taking in any negativity from it and saying yeah. it was selfish or this out there, or why did they do it or I can't understand. Or being angry. Right. I think more so you can, it should show people why, like how crucial it is that we need to be g- more gentle with one another. Yes. And that we need to live in a world that has more sensitivity and positivity. And Less where, judgment. Yes. Where everybody just is nice. Yes. <laughs> you know, and I think that that's what it should teach. Yeah. It should show that we live in such a, like, fucking this world where everybody's critiquing you constantly right. that it's just like, let's just live. You yeah. Know? And telling you what you're doing wrong. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's what it should do. And it's, it's sad and it, but it can also, it can, there's a lot of positive that can come from it. Yes. I think it can teach a lot of people to just be kinder and more gentle. Yes. And that's what I hope to do yeah. um, with this. And I mean, who knows what I would love to after this, like in doing the photography and um, like speak on mental health mm-hmm. places. And I would love to do that. And um, also, I was wondering if I could plug my website. Yes, or... of course. And okay. I will, um, after this, Yeah. send me an email or text or whatever with any links that you want okay. to Because I can link it all. So people... Oh, my gosh. But yeah, say crazy. what it is Thank anyway. So ah, I don't want to clap and have the dog come no, back. But I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. she's, she's I don't sleeping. get too happy. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's JillianPhotography.com. And Jillian is spelled G-I-L-L-I-A-N. Perfect photography.com so you're doing photography on your own now right i'm doing it on my own i also do it on the beach um at a resort okay and so it's really that's so good for my mental health because it's first of all it's everyone's like in good moods it's like families and couples on vacation Mm -hmm. and then i'm out watching the sunset it's like sunset photos like a few days a week and it's like oh (laughs) so i'm out watching um like it's just beautiful Mm -hmm. so i'm just enjoying that because I get happy people and to be out in the sunset and just like have your feet in the sand and all of that is like been amazing so that plus like the artistic side of photography like I'm going to be selling all my own photos and everything on Saturday yeah it's really exciting um that's great it's just like I finally feel like you know when you want to know like what you've done like what your thing is that you want to do in your Mm -hmm. life and and what your passion is and it's like I'm just living my passion right now Mm -hmm. and it just feels just aligned that's amazing. Yeah. You crushed it. You did such Thanks. a great job. You should be so proud of yourself. Really? Yes. Oh, thank your brother you. would be so proud of you. Seriously. Oh, that makes me feel so good. No, really, he would be. He I feel like he's going to be with me at the photography exhibit. Too. He's with you all the time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Of course. I'm yeah. serious. But no, great job. Thank, thank you for you. wanting to come on and share your story. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for having of me. Course. I'm like, so this has been amazing.